Hey guys, welcome to Divine the Night. I wanted to change things up a little bit different and try something new. Uh, so this is a video and we'll see how it goes. Um, and I'm going to post this, if you're watching it, it's already posted, uh, for tonight for our message. I hope you enjoy, guys. Welcome to our Divine the Night. I wanted to start with reading an excerpt from this book we've kind of been going through. Um, it's really just been hitting me in a, in a great season and part of my life and I just love sharing too what um, what I'm going through with you guys and, and I'm definitely an external processor as well and I want to read an excerpt from this book and then we're going to jump into a passage in Mark chapter 10 um, but let's just start um, I'll pray and then, then we'll get reading Lord I thank you for this time I think we're just trying a little new format uh, for our divine gathering tonight I pray that you would um, pierce our hearts with your words Jesus uh, show us what you want for our life and help us to kind of clear out everything else to make room for what you want um, from us, Jesus. We love you. In your name, amen. Um, and again, this is Bob Goff, um, and the book's called Dream Big. He writes, I was traveling in the Midwest and arrived at my hotel a little after one o'clock in the morning. It had been a long day, and I was barely able to stay awake. I think the hotel attendant was in the same boat because it took him forever to retrieve my reservation and finally give me my room key. I curled up in the lobby armchair while I waited and maybe I could squeeze in a few Z's. When I finally got my key and made it to the door of my room, I slipped inside, threw my bag on the bed, I fumbled around for the light switches, flipped on the lights, and to my absolute shock, discovered there was a woman in the room. She started screaming, this is my room. I looked at my key and said, this is my room. As I backed up toward the door, I grabbed my bag and ran out of the room as fast as I could. I felt like Joseph. Suffice it to say, I was wide awake by then and pretty miffed at the mistake the guy at the counter had made. I tried to control my frustration as I walked back to the desk, tossed the card key back at him and asked if I could have a room that didn't already have a sleeping person in my bed. The guy looked up with his glazed eyes and said, dude, sorry, man, slipped me a new card key and went back to the game he was playing on his phone. Feeling less than reassured, I got to my second room of the early morning and thankfully had the room all to myself. These days, I'm a little more tentative whenever I walk into a hotel room. I'm sure you will be now too. I'm tempted to throw a flashbang grenade in first and yell something like, fire in the hole, before entering. Our experiences, both good and bad, shape us or scar us. Here's the point. As I reflected on my ambitions, there have been countless times when I told myself, I've given Jesus the whole room. When what I've actually done is just emptied a couple drawers or cleaned off several inches of space in the closet for him to hang a few ideas in my life. The simple but difficult fact is he wants the whole room and everything in it, including us. Many of us live like hoarders, though there's not a lot of space left to give Jesus, even if we wanted to. We won't be able to advance our worthwhile ambitions if our lives are already fully occupied. Think for a moment what you filled your room with, both good and bad. Activities like careers or bowling or fly fishing. Attitudes you've experienced like worry, anger, frustration, joy, or empathy. Some of these things are good and beautiful and lasting. Others are trespassers in your life. Jesus isn't going to be satisfied standing outside your door knocking while you try to tidy up before letting him in. God doesn't want to invite us. God doesn't want us to invite him to sit quietly in a corner like a celebrity guest either. He's not our concierge or our butler, our muse or our roommate. Jesus is a king who came to make a kingdom, but he's not going to try and build it on top of our stuff or around all of our activities. If the room is full, we can invite him in all we want, but we should expect that he's more likely to do major renovations than just rearrange the furniture or provide us with room service. If the room is already full, he'll just wait to come more fully into our lives when it isn't. Jesus didn't say he'd, he'd know the room was his if we said a moonlit prayer at camp or if we told everybody it was his room or if we used all the right words or showed up to church on Sundays or did a bunch of nice things for him. Jesus said people would know whose room it is by what happens both inside and outside of it. Simply put, He's more likely to put much of what you've collected in a dumpster and light it on fire than turn down your bed and put a mint on your pillow. There's no do not disturb sign we can hang on the door. If you fill your life with Jesus and operate with love and grace, you'll be in the right place. 
If you express your faith through love, you're doing it correctly. If you trust in him, you'll get the rest you need. Sometimes we make Jesus a lot more complicated than Jesus instructed. The fix is simpler, more intentional faith, not a busier or easier one. Complicated theology isn't bad. Jesus never said it was a prerequisite or qualification for the unschooled, ordinary people he invited to follow him. Certainly, learn a ton about what you believe, but don't be like the self-identified teachers who gave education waves to him. You don't need a bunch of $20 words to couple your faith to your ambitions. When your faith is anchored by the few things God said we should all care about, it would be more than enough to keep you clear and focused on the road ahead. Let's say you clear the room of everything in your, in your faith and ask yourself, if I had to add one thing back into my life, what would it be? It sounds like one of those moments when you think you're supposed to give a Sunday school answer and say, Jesus? That's usually a safe bet, but not always the most honest answer. But here, if I cleared the room of absolutely everything else, the first thing I would add back to my life is Jesus. Not all the trappings and manufactured religious rules or arguments that aren't things Jesus spent his time on. In fact, I'd lose all the religious talk and complicated words that create distance between people rather than provide clarity and unity among them. The second thing I'd add back into my life is a pretty easy pick as well. I'd add my family and friends. We won't travel far without the ones we've already traveled with. Are you pursuing your ambitions? Don't miss out on it or mess up with it. Your family, your friends, your greatest reward in life will be found in the handful of people you have developed beautiful, loving, authentic, vulnerable relationships with. When Jesus met the first disciples fishing, he told them to push out a little deeper. They thought it was a stupid idea, but you know what? They did it anyway. Push out into deeper waters with your relationships. I know it can be hard. Do it anyway. You'll find a kind of clarity about your ambitions in the deeper waters that you won't in the shallows. The third thing I'll add would be the things that add joy, purpose, and fulfillment to my life. I'm not just talking about my vocation. For many of us, what we do for a career is how we make rent. It's honorable to have a job and provide for the ones you love. The problem is that some of us spend so much time trying to provide for our families that we're not providing for our families. What your family wants is you, not your earning potential. Get clear on the people, whimsy, and capers that have added the most meaning to your life and add these people and things back in. If you remember a time when you were engaged in meaningful, purposeful work and deeper, more authentic relationships, but you are no longer there, return to these things. Add them back to your life. Here's a tougher question for most of us. What is the seventh or eighth or tenth thing you'd add back if you cleared the room of all the things you've collected in your life? Honestly, I'm not sure I even have room for a seventh thing. Isn't that crazy? It turns out I only have a few things that make up the most important parts of my life. I bet the same is true for you. Don't get distracted by people who insist on knowing your position on the 13th thing or something that isn't even on your radar at all. Keep your eye on the ball. Darkness doesn't need to destroy us. It only needs to distract us. If you want to get after your ambitions, don't take the bait. This book's been just really fantastic in guiding me into what my really ambitions are and kind of stripping away just things in my life to have me really analyze what is necessary and what isn't. Um, it, it's just a great thing to be self-aware. And in our self-awareness, we have to be honest. Because we know if, if that in our attempt to be self-aware that we're not being genuine with ourselves. And God knows that even more. Um, and I've just really enjoyed looking at these parts of my life that, that just need transformation and need changing. And in order to, to do that, I'm realizing that I need to kind of peel back some layers and, and go into the deeper waters that he's mentioned. Um, and this reminded me of a story um, in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. And it's about a rich young man. Um, and I'm just going to read it again to you guys. It says he was setting out on his journey and a man ran up, knelt before him and asked. And this is a, a rich man talking to Jesus. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. 
honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking back at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Before I continue any more of the story, I just think it's so interesting that when this man approaches Jesus and he says to him, what must I, he calls him good teacher. And then Jesus directs right back to the father. No one's good except God alone. And he's, I think he's kind of testing the man here to see, like, where does he fall on this spectrum of who God is? And then he says to the man, the commandments, don't you know about these? Isn't it about honoring God and these commandments? And the man, I, I don't know if I believe him necessarily when he says, I've done all these commandments. Now, I think Jesus is getting at here the deeper part. It's not so much about action. It is, but it's about the heart behind the action. Um, if you just go through this list and, and you think about when Jesus says, if anyone has hated someone else, you've committed murder. Maybe you haven't. Um, committed adultery by sleeping with someone else, or maybe you've looked at things that you know you shouldn't have looked at, and it's happened in your mind, because it's really about the heart level. And he's kind of challenging this man to see if he knows that, if he knows that it's not just about the actions, but is it about the heart level. And it's about going deeper. So the, the man kind of says, why well, did all these things? And then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. I kind of think of that as like, Someone telling me, I've done all the right things. I know exactly what to say. I know exactly what to do. Well, why are you asking this question in the first place? If you know exactly what to do and you know exactly you've done all the right things, why are you asking then how to inherit eternal life? Shouldn't you know if you've done all these right things? And I think of this part where Jesus says, or it says Jesus looking at him loved him. I think that's so Jesus. I don't know another way to put it, but... Even in the midst of this man's like almost delusion, Jesus is still looking upon him with love and compassion. And he knows his heart. And he knows the one thing that is going to push him to, to, to follow him. Right? The one thing that this man needs to do in order for him to really to follow Jesus in his heart, not just in his actions. So he says, you lack one thing. Sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. A lot of the times I, I feel like I hear this verse and people say, yeah, he asked the rich man to sell everything, but he couldn't. And that's it. That's the end of the story. But the next thing he says, and come follow me. So not just sell everything and give it to the poor, but sell everything, give it to the poor. And the most important part, follow me. Because it's not just about getting rid of like our earthly things right? Or, or doing the, the right action so that when people see, we then feel good, right? It, it's not about the external image, but it's about the internal image, right? So if you're not, a, it, anyone could just sell everything, but if the man's still not following Jesus, what did that really matter? And then the man disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And I think this man is sorrowful, not just because he can't let go of what the world has to offer, not just because of that, but also he can't follow Jesus because he's no, he's so tied down to what the world has to offer. And that's what he wants. And I think just so much like our lives, we're so, if you think of like a room, we're so tied down to like what the room looks like, what's on the walls, what people see. We're not willing to strip it all down, just like it says in the book here, to then really figure out what should we put up on the walls. We're not willing to, to give up the waters that we're fishing in to go out into deeper waters because it's rough out there and it's tough. And it's hard to go deep and to be vulnerable with other people because we're afraid of what's going to happen. Just like we're afraid that when we're out in the deeper ocean, it's going to be rough and it's going to be uh, cold and it's going to uh, just be really difficult. We don't want to go in the deep waters and we may say we do and we may tell other people, yeah, like I want to go deep in my faith, but we really don't desire to change anything in our lives, right? If we really are following Jesus, we're not going to be disheartened by the fact that, that he wants to strip everything away 
Because in the process of him stripping away, we realize what's really important in our lives. And not to sound cliche like Bob Goff says, but um, the number one thing we want to put back on the wall really is Jesus. Because it's, it's his room anyway. And he doesn't just want what's in the room, right? He doesn't want just the man to sell the possessions, but he wants the man to follow him, right? He doesn't just want um, us to do the things that look good, but he really wants our hearts to be aligned with who he is. And part of figuring out who we are is going to involve the process of, of taking everything out of our room, getting rid of everything, and kind of starting fresh to know what things do we add back into our life, right? What things do we add back in that honor Jesus and that push us more towards him? And then in verse 23, it says, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples. So after this incident, he's kind of looking at his disciples and he says, it's, it will be difficult for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. And I think the reason it's difficult is wealth is tied to this worldly sense. And when we have wealth, we feel like we're successful because that's what the world says. So there becomes less of a, of a need for God because we feel like we're successful and we have a lot of money or we have a lot of things. We have a lot of friends. We have a good reputation. So why do I need Jesus in my life? Because everything is really good. So it's hard for people that, that have a lot of status and a lot of wealth to follow Jesus because they don't see the need for him. And part of that, I think, comes we don't see really the depravity in our heart. Because maybe the, the sin in our heart hasn't pushed people away. Or maybe it hasn't um, hurt our finances or whatever it may be. Because we have those things, we think we don't need Jesus. So it's really hard for people with like that a lot of money or even money or, or reputation or, or just that self-image to see the need for Jesus because we think we're so great already. Why do I need him? So this is what he's telling the disciples. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult is it to enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So again, he's just using this really, I guess, harsh image saying, it's so hard for people that are in love with what the world has to give it up to follow Jesus. We can't fall in love with what the world has to offer because it's going to be even it's going to be so much harder to follow Jesus. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm saying it's very difficult to strip all those things away that, that the world says makes us good to then want to follow Jesus to allow him then to build back up what we've taken away. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we've left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who's left his house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And I, it's just so true that if we try and do these things on our own strength, it's impossible. But with God, it's not impossible. It's way possible for God to make this change and, and make this transformation in our life. It starts with giving up everything. And coming to that, that baseline, that, that square one of saying, who do you want me to be, Jesus? And these things in my life, what of those things or of those people do you want in my life? And it's allowing him to help bring those things back into our life through his filter. And we'll start to realize that everything we have and everything that we're pursuing without Jesus really means nothing without him. And then Peter is like, well, wait, we left everything to follow you. It's just so funny. It's like, I just align with Peter a lot. I'd be asking Jesus the same thing, almost like, wait, wait, well, well what about us? Um, didn't we do good? Um, and Jesus is so thoughtful and reassuring. Uh, and he says, yes, but don't forget. It's about the first will be last and the last will be first. I always think about this. If you've ever been over a, a friend's house or over or somewhere to eat, um, and it's time for everyone to get up and eat, and there's the people that go first and the people that go last. It's like, I always like going first because you feel like you can get way more food, right? Before, you know, it runs out. But I think a lot about this verse just in, in that scenario. And I'm not saying that that's what it means. I'm just saying we need to set up 
things in our life that remind us about who Jesus is. And I'm not saying I do it perfect all the time, but I like going last because it just reminds me of this. And it's just something I need to, to help keep me grounded. So I love getting food last because everyone already got their food and it's kind of the same thing. You can almost get what you want. You don't want to be the middle person because then you're worried about the person behind you and you want to make sure you leave enough rice for them or leave enough whatever. Um, and I kind of joke about that, but we really want to set up things and reminders in our lives. Almost like, um, you know, when you see or do something, then it reminds you, oh my gosh, that's who Jesus is. Uh, and we need to just set up these markers um, to remind us. I, I need that so much in my life. It's just reminders of who Jesus is daily. I don't want to have to wait um, until it just a specific time in church on Sunday to remind me to follow Jesus. I need things daily and every single day. And I think about that illustration of in our room, whatever's on the walls, we need to take those things down. That way when the things we put back up, when we see those things, they'll be reminders of who Jesus is. So this, this process is difficult. It's hard. And I just want to encourage you guys tonight that you need people around you to help walk with you through this process. I had so many people that walked through, that walked with me through life and that still do to this day um, that I just needed. Not that I, that God couldn't do it without them, but it's the fact that God used them to do it with me. Uh, and, and we need those people in our life. You need those people that can help you stay on your faith journey to keep the path to follow him no matter what comes out your way. Um, it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. It's hard. But it's so good to know that whatever's on the walls in our room is what he put there. And that's my encouragement to you guys tonight. Whatever ambitions, whatever desires, whatever dreams you have, lay them at the foot of at the feet of Jesus, and He's going to help you sift through them to know what what are what of these things are good that push you more towards Christ, man. Because I don't want to be doing things that are just a waste. You ever you ever um have to build like a piece of get furniture at Target or something, and you put it together and you put something backwards, and then when you get to the very end, you realize that it's backwards. I was putting together this um, cabinet and it was these tracks that go inside the cabinet and that's what the drawer then goes in on. And you can't really tell which way it goes because the instructions weren't very good. I put them on backwards. Halfway through, I realized they're backwards. I change them. And then when I get to the very end, I realized that I had them right the whole time. And when I went to put the drawer and it wouldn't roll in correctly, so I had to flip them again. But I think life is like that sometimes. We're going to try and we're going to fail. And we're going to try again and we're going to fail. And it's hard and it's tough and it hurts and it's embarrassing and um, it just doesn't feel good. But what's good is knowing that that process is transforming me when I allow the work of Jesus to come and, and change me and walk with me and allow other people that follow the Lord to speak into my life. It, it really is transforming. It feels so good to see where God has brought me to where I am now, and also to see how much more work I have to do. Um, that just really shows the power of God, because with me it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So I love you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Um, let me know if you like this format more or less. I would love to hear your feedback. Again, don't forget to like our video, subscribe. It really helps the channel. I really love and miss you guys. Uh, let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you so much for this study of, of this rich man um, that, that decided that he couldn't follow Jesus, Lord. Help us not to be like those like him, Lord. We, we want to follow you. So help us to be able to give up those things in our life that hold us back. Help us to strip away all the things that are in our room. That way we can start with a blank slate, a blank canvas to allow you to help put on the walls, Lord, the things that honor you. We love you so much, Jesus. In your name, amen. Thanks again for tuning in, guys. Shoots.